And the subject matter we have been dealing with for a good number of weeks, how Jesus made disciples, and he's still making disciples using the gifts in the church, fivefold ministry, to bring about that completion, perfection. And when Jesus began to train these disciples and to spend time with them, spent three and a half years with them, and just the calling that God placed upon the hearts and lives of these men in itself was significant and important. And I trust that we're willing to be a disciple of Christ. That means a follower of Jesus, one who is teachable, and that we take it even a step further, that we're willing to make an investment in other people's lives, to mentor people, to make disciples, so they'll make disciples. That's how the church grows. It's just not having a charismatic leader, necessarily, um, one who flames up, and then eventually that person fades out and goes on to eternity. But we want this church to eventually, uh, when I go on to meet the Lord, um, make that transition, another man, another couple comes in and just takes it to a higher place that they continue to make disciples. The great commandment, the mandate from the church to go into all the world, begin where you are and expand out making disciples and teaching them and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When you examine how Jesus trained disciples, in my introduction, I mentioned he took advantage of every event, every crisis situation to equip these disciples because of the future before them when they became apostles. It was not an easy thing. He said, I'm going to send you out as sheep amongst wolves. He tells us even today in the book of Timothy, if you're willing to follow Christ and live a godly life, you will suffer persecution. There is a cost to being a disciple. Sometimes the persecution and the testing that you get is not necessarily from the world, which is a factor, but sometimes that persecution comes because you take a stand for holiness and righteousness and a godly life in your own home. Now, it's easier, I think, to deal with someone who isn't within your family circle, someone you don't know who attacks you, who falsely accuses you, who comes against you. It's easier to deal with that than someone that you love and that you invest in, and then they turn away from God or betray you. That hurts. That's painful. Anyone identify with me? Huh? You got some of that maybe going on in your life previously? Maybe it's happening now? And we have to be able to put our faith and trust in God and let Him work and move in the hearts of maybe those prodigals or that situation. When Jesus fed the 5,000, said 5,000 men, so there were evidently women there and children, so I don't know the exact number. But he did one of the most awesome miracles that ever took place in the history, in the ministry of Jesus. We took two fish and five loaves and separated them in groups of 100. And they began to pass out the food, and it was there. The amazing thing was, they weren't starving. It wasn't like the feeding of the 4,000 where they were three days following Jesus and out in a desolate place. They could have gone to Starbucks and got a cup of coffee, which was nearby, or run down to McDonald's. But that didn't happen. There was a purpose in what Jesus did. Many times when he's doing something, if we're not spiritually in tune, we're going to miss it. Because the multitudes missed what Jesus was saying and doing. And they perceived things from a natural point of view. I watched a, 
a movie last night was made in 1997. And the reason I wanted to watch it was Matthew McConaughey and um, what's that girl went to Yale and she's an actress. Jodie Foster. Thank you, Sheila. All right. The name of the movie was Contact. She perceived the world from a scientific mindset using empirical evidence. The word empirical means by experience or by observation, meaning I won't believe unless I see the facts. And Matthew McConaughey was a young man of the cloth who didn't wear the cloth, and he was a man of faith and believed in God. And the reason I want to see it, because he did such an excellent job when she challenged him and said, prove to me that God exists. And he thought for a moment, looked at her, and give you a little background. The whole thing started when she was 10 years old and her father died of a massive heart attack. And he was gone. And he raised her with an idea of looking into the galaxy, into the stars, and trying to find her purpose and place in life. And so they had a brilliant mind, went to MIT, uh, the best school, Caltech, and all that sort of thing. So she uh, was looking and wanted to contact if there was life out there and those 400 billion stars and all that big space and surely in that big space there's got to be something else out there I know for sure what's out there God Almighty and so she said I just don't believe that there's a God prove it to me and his position was I accept it based on the doctrine and principle of faith same thing Jesus was trying to communicate to these people when he preached the sermon on the bread of life, which we'll talk about shortly. And he looked at her and he asked her a question. Now, this is a brilliant way when you deal with issues like this. When you're asked a question, you come back with a question. He said, did your father love you? Oh, yes. Did you love your father? Yes, I love my father. What a stupid question to ask. He said, prove it. Prove it. She kind of just looked like, Don't, you have to accept and believe what I say is true. That's what I say about God. There was um, an old saint. I was trying to recall his name. Anselm, who had the five proofs for the doctrine of Christ. Humanity, mankind cannot prove empirically with any form of evidence that God exists. We know that God exists and that he's real and that this word is true. We base it on the doctrine of faith. The only way that you and I can please God is by faith. Blessed are those who never seen or heard and yet believe. That's you and me. Amen? Well, these disciples are eyewitnesses. These disciples are eyewitnesses. They were there. They saw Jesus. They saw the miracles. They heard the sermons. Not only these 12 disciples, but the multitudes, all those who gathered. On that day, who in the world could take two fish and five loaves and feed 15,000 people and have 12 baskets left over? Amazing. One of the great miracles. So I'll draw your attention to John chapter 6. And he preached a sermon to these multitudes because he ministered to them and then he jumped the disciples jumped in a ship. He went up into the mountains to pray. And the people came from other places. 
and wanted to find out what's happening. This something, something is extraordinary happening here. This, there's a prophet amongst us. And they followed him from where the feeding took place to another place that he spent a great deal of time, Capernaum, which is the northern part of Galilee. And so when they said, all right, Jesus, your disciples are in a ship. They go out to the Sea of Galilee. There's a storm, and you're up in the mountains. And then that's taking place. The storm's over. Jesus rescues his disciples from a severe storm. He came walking on the water. And then he appears in Capernaum. How did you get here? They all sorts of questions. And then he began to, to give this sermon. And the title of the sermon, The Bread of Life, beginning in verse 32. I just want to read, not the entire sermon, but just the heart of it. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father give you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Then they said unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. Say what? He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come unto me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath giveth me, I shall lose or should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. And then the Jews murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur, not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man therefore that hath not heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I give him of my flesh, which I gave for the life of the world. Bless the reading of God's word. Now, when they heard this message, these people severely judged that message. No question about it, you're, you're following along in my notes. The Jewish mindset at that time was not open to change, and what Jesus said was offensive is a stumbling block, controversial. The gospel still today is controversial. Now a lot of days people are wanting to fill the seats, which sounds like a good thing. And every pastor wants the church to be overflowing. It was exciting. I was sitting next to the pastor of Church of Messiah, and we were on the front seat there, and we began to worship you. Turn around and look behind you. Because I hadn't looked behind, and, and I didn't know how many people were there. I go, oh, glory to God. A preacher's dream come to pass. Amen. <laughs> so they were all packed out and standing back there. 
And I said, you need to see this every Sunday, huh, Fred? He said, oh, glory to God. <laughs> you know. And, but it was, the message, the gospel is controversial because it tells people, you're a sinner. Well, let's, not, let's not say that. Let's kind of tone things down. It's a lack of self-esteem, really, your problem. <laughs> and let's not say, let's not talk about the cross because it's a symbol of death. Let's not talk about you've got to die in order to live. Let, let's not be, let's be positive. I know for my car to, to operate, that battery has to have a negative and a positive. If it's just positive, that thing will never start. There's a heaven and hell. There's a God. There's a devil. There's sin. There's righteousness. Amen? But the positive thing is when you embrace this controversial, difficult message. You've got to confess your sins. Jesus said, he, the son that, he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life, but the wrath of God shall abide upon him. Now, that's the word of God. That's pretty rough. Either you bend your knee and confess your mouth, and surrender your life to Jesus. If you don't repent, you will perish. Oh, let's, let's, that's kind of heavy. Let, let, I mean, we want to we want to win people. Let's let's make it easy for them. Let's give them easy believism or sloppy, greasy grace. God loves you. He accepts you as you are. Just continue as you are. No, you know what repentance means. Change your thinking. Change your life. Well, how do you do that? When you yield to God and he comes and takes residence within you, he will steer you into the right place in the straight and narrow. So Jesus doesn't hold back. And what he was saying was controversial. And, and the thing that really bothered them when he said, I am that bread of life. See, he just finished feeding them. And they said, man, this is awesome. Welfare, eternal welfare. <laughs> Isn't that what's happening in our world? You know, I've been to Haiti a number of times, and they are still in abject poverty, which they have been for 200 years when they made voodooism, witchcraft, their national religion. And what sustains their lifestyle, and 85% of the people in Haiti are unemployed. Most people live on less than $1 a day. It's survival. I, didn't, I had never seen a heavyset person in Haiti. I never seen anyone smoking a cigarette because they don't have those luxury items. And their answer to poverty is not from without looking at what's happening is that America just drops through the church tons and tons of everything they need to sustain them. Therefore, they have no strength or willpower to put their faith and trust in God, change their belief system, get rid of their corrupt government. And a nation to come out of poverty has to be within itself. We, early on, contributed to the problem in Haiti. I may have said this before. One of the first projects we did was we filled a container out here with shoes. We're going to send shoes to Haiti. This is a good thing. We're going to give these shoes because a lot of the people are without footwear, barefooted. They need shoes. So we sent the shoes to Haiti. And there was a guy who was trying to dig himself out of poverty, and he opened a small business in the town square there of selling shoes so he could make a living and support his family. And so we come along, and we bring thousands of pairs of shoes and feel good that we're helping people and gave it to the people in that community and put that guy out of business. 
stop helping us because you're hurting us. Same thing happens in Africa. Feed the people, send rice. You see these commercials. These people are starving. They show these little kids looking in the trash can and all this. And so they stop farming because we're sending food. These people in these multitudes, the problem was they couldn't see that Jesus wanted to give them more than just two fish and five loaves. He wanted to give them the bread of life. And when he said, I am the bread of life, come eat of me. They said, what? You're the son of Joseph and Mary. We know him. Who do you think you are? Murmured and complained. They, they could not see, could not believe, could not embrace something that had eternal value. We got to be careful, people, that we don't put all our time and focus in on the temporal, spend all our time trying to hold on what we got and never make an investment in the eternal. It's an easy, slippery slope. I have to guard myself. I think it's important that we take care of what God's given to us. It's part of being a good steward. But I want to fulfill the eternal purpose that God placed in your heart and my heart, and we do what called God called us to do. That we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that we minister to our family, to the household of faith, and then beyond. Amen? And that we do what God has called us to do. One thing we can do is on October 29th that we come together and that we don't put all the burden upon just a few people here to do the work of the Lord. That it's more than just the church staff here carrying the workload, just a few people given, that we all end this together. Amen? And that not only our church is doing the heart and mind and will of God, but we join with other like-minded churches. And that we all come together and we see a fresh move. We need in Cherokee County a move of the Holy Ghost. I want to see people being baptized in the Holy Spirit, moving in the gifts of the Spirit. I want to see people excited out there making disciples, sharing the truth of God's Word, not trying to push it down someone's throat, but being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and do what God's called us to do. You don't have to be young. You don't have to be old. You just have to be, use me, God. Elizabeth Ratliff sent me a picture today. This woman who's in her senior years in Zambia taking two little kids to Bible school and they're out there walking and working and serving. So don't say, like she initially said, God don't send me, I'm too old. God said, I want you. And she's in, not an affluent area, she's in a place that is needful, a place that is desolate, and but God is using her to touch these women and these children. Can you say amen? So uh, what happened, these people didn't understand that um, Jesus was the bread of life. And not only was he saying that, but bread for it to be eaten, it's got to be broken. He came to be broken, to give us life, and they just couldn't see. Now, I have to be careful I don't severely judge these people and say, man, couldn't I? I mean, if someone takes two fish and five loaves and feeds 5,000 people, I'm going to believe. Jesus made a strong statement. He says, no one can come unto me unless the Father draws him, unless God opens their eyes. You're at the mercy of God. I'm at the mercy of God to open my eyes, to open my heart, to give me revelation. You can study and study. There's nothing wrong with studying the Word of God, but you need to go there and say, God, give me spiritual understanding and revelation of your Word that's just more than words on a page, but it's not only affecting me and changing me, 
in my life, but also I can speak the word of God and not return void. Then he says a real strong statement, really set them off. If you look in Roman number two, a point D, Jesus said, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. When the multitude heard this, they said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? We miss it. They miss what the understanding of the kingdom of God was all about. If we're not careful, we can miss it. What, what does he mean when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood? And I researched this out. I came up with two things. These two metaphors he uses, eating flesh and drinking blood, sounds like something on the verge of cannibalism. And, they, and that's how they thought, how can I eat his flesh? Give me a hand, give me a foot, give me a leg, give me an arm. Take a big bite. And, and you know, maybe, what are you thinking right now? What's your interpretation of the scripture? What's he saying when he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood? I mean, the Zulu tribe in their inauguration of young men require them to drink blood. And we know that the shedding of blood in the Bible speaks about the remission of sins. So these two metaphors explain the action of believing and having faith in Jesus. Because Jesus said in verse 47, 48, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, or he that eateth and drinketh of me, have everlasting life. Amen? Eating and drinking, believing, putting your faith in God. When you do, you receive this spiritual blessing of receiving eternal life. Also, a step further. I believe when it talks about eating and drinking, you're identifying with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you try to save your life, he says you lose it. But if you lose your life, you'll save it. So eating and drinking, believing, having faith, also identify with Jesus that you die to live. Does that make sense? You see the spiritual implication there? Amen? I'm selling out. If I'm going to partake of the life of God and take that, then I make an exchange. I forfeit my life. You forfeit your life. And you let God live his life in and through you. You see what I'm saying? That's the thing we contend with each and every day. We, we have the struggle between walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. You see, they wanted the blessing of the flesh, but they didn't want to walk with God. He, said, he called them out. He said, your you motive is wrong. You're here. The reason you're following me because you want something to eat. I want to give you something better. I want to give you the gift of eternal life. I want you to become a son and daughter of God Almighty. I want you to follow me. You know what the response was? They turned their back on him. He said, of the multitudes and the other disciples, they walked away from him. The same thing is happening today. Paul said in 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, before the Son of God comes, the second coming, there will be a falling away. When God stands and says, okay, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to follow me, there's a cost. You have to forfeit your life. You must give up your freedom to have freedom. You must give up your choices and take my choice. And we struggle with that. It's called the process of sanctification, even as believers. We must, Paul said, daily I die because I must yield to God. But what about me? 
What about my life? What about my will? C.S. Lewis said there's two kinds of people. There's the person who says, thy will be done, O God. And then the other person says, no, my will be done. And you know what God, he doesn't force himself upon a person. He says, okay, your will be done. And he lets that person go. And their will, he says, hell is a monument to their will. So they say to God, no. It's my life, and I'll live it my way. I see that happening right now. I see people, and it grieves me. If it grieves me, and I'm a man, how much it grieves the Father to know those who come and have tasted of the good things of God, who seemingly embrace all the attributes of what it means to follow God and then the world comes along and then the the calling of the flesh and deception of the enemy and they become just like these multitudes and all these other so called followers of Jesus they say you know church is boring reading the Bible is boring being a Christian is boring the world is is so wonderful and so appetizing. You look at all these lies you see in the propaganda put out. If you really want to have the fullness of life, you need to drink this lager beer. This will cause you to be a man. And then you see the commercial on sandals. You see these attractive women in these bikinis, you know, walking on the sand, and this guy following along behind us. Oh, that's life. I want a vacation like that, you know. And all these things. Isn't that the way of the enemy? Put out the wide and easy way leads to destruction. And that's fullness and happiness. And how so many don't want to accept the fact that Jesus is the bread of life. He says, I've come that you might have life. And he says this more abundantly. I mean, what God created here on earth, I said, there's some beautiful things. I enjoy the outdoors, walking through the woods in the fall of the year, or on the fish bank, I enjoy those things. But what God says in his word, eyes not seen, nor ears heard, or has entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. If you love God, if you really love God, then you keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. God's not out there trying to make life stiff and boring. His commandments are there to protect us. His commandments are there so we can have the abundant life. Can you say amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Jamon. Amen. Then he he says his last statement here. And Jesus said, do you take offense at this? What if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? So he's talking about the resurrection. He's alluding to the resurrection. The multitudes couldn't put their head around it. This is a prophetic statement. And Jesus, the bread of life, was capable of conquering sin and destroying death. Paul said, without the resurrection of Christ, our faith is in vain. No man can come to Christ unless it is given unto him of the Father. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Here's all we need to do in being obedient to God the Father. If we lift him up, amen? If we exalt the Lord, he will draw all men unto him. Amen? That's happening. What we need in Cherokee County is a full-blown, Holy Ghost, sky blue, 
sin-killing move of the Holy Ghost. Amen? Uh, to me, that's the best way for church growth because when you look in the book of Acts, you read about how the apostles went out, the followers of Jesus. It whittled down. When he turned to the 12, when all those left, he looked at the 12 and he said, will you leave also? He said, we can't. You, you have the words of life, of eternal life. You're the son of God. Where, where can we go? Amen? We need God to come down through the power of the Holy Ghost and set a fire within me, within you. Amen? And we need to be bold, need to be smart. We need not to hold our tongue, but listen to the voice of God and reach out to those who are close to us and then move beyond. Now, if you're a believer, when you die and stand before God, there's a number of places in the New Testament. Second Corinthians chapter 5 comes to mind. Romans chapter 14 comes to mind. Everybody has to give account of their life. Your sins are under the blood. You don't give account of your sins. But you have to give account of what you did with your life. Did I just come to church and pay my tithes, give my offerings, and sit there from Sunday to Sunday? Or did I listen to the voice of God and make an eternal difference with my time, my resources, my gifts, my life, and doing something to honor and glorify God? Am I willing to go to Haiti for five days and do something that seems insignificant but yet powerful? Am I willing to minister? I watched Christine out there at Forever Fed. Sits out there in that hot sun at that table there and uh, making sure that people are being accountable. They're not taking more than what they should take because a lot of people are coming there like the multitudes. I just want something to eat. Dudley and I walk down through the aisle, and we go up and we talk to people and we say, this is a wonderful day, isn't it? The sun's shining, and you're out here sweating. Can we talk to you about God? Can we pray with you? And Stella was there with her daughter, Victoria. We prayed for this young man that they love dearly who's being taken advantage of. We prayed for God to come and grab hold of his heart. We prayed for their health and well-being. Minister unto people. Not there trying to force ourselves upon them, but d taking time to do that. It's easier for me just to go and sit where, somewhere cool. But just going there and, and just being there and available. And he was saying, well, what did you accomplish? God says for us to plant, to water, to cultivate, but he's the one who brings the increase. I say to God, Lord, I think there's some things I can still do, some things I yet want to do to impact people's hearts and lives. Amen? I believe that Jesus is the bread of life, and I need to eat of him and drink of him each and every day, identify with him, being willing to take up my cross, you're willing to take up your cross and follow him to do what God has called us to do. Amen? I want to see, not that means every seat is filled, that, that everyone's a disciple, but we want to see not only this assembly, but the ones down the road this way and that way, across the way, that every house of worship is packed out. There's enough people in this county to fill every church three times over and still not have enough room. You see, what we're talking about, how Jesus made disciples. And we need to be making disciples. And I think about this. I realize the controversy surrounding Jesus. Think about it the 12, and then he had this perception, one of you will betray me. 
And you can think of the heartache that he had. And sometimes we look at the situations in our hearts and lives and we see that everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs God in their life. Amen? Amen. 